This sermon is titled God, Science, Technology, Faith. Be enriched as you listen. As we had uh, shared last Sunday, we're taking three Sundays this in April uh, to address topics that are important culturally, from a cultural perspective. Topics that are important. Last Sunday we talked about art and uh, God, uh, God and faith in relation to art and creativity. Today, we want to talk about, or the, the sermon title is God, Science, Technology, and Faith. And our intent is to address a few matters that are culturally important, important in our society. We're going to talk a little bit about artificial intelligence, neural, neural implants, and also in vitro fertilization and frozen embryos. We're going to talk about just these three, or if you want to break the last two separately, four areas or matters. And the reason we are doing this is to help us develop a framework on how to respond to these and many other such matters that you and I are confronted with in society. How do we respond to these things? And also as we go into the sermon, we'll mention why it's important for you and me to have a response, not just pretend it doesn't matter to us. And so we're going to do that. And the intent is not to prescribe an answer, but is to give us a framework to think. That you and I will be able to come up with the answers as we are faced with matters such as these. But let's begin with Isaiah chapter 28, verses 23 to 29. Isaiah chapter 28, verses 23 to 29. Verse 23, give ear and hear my voice, listen and hear my speech. Does the plowman keep plowing all day to sow? Does he keep turning his soil and breaking the clods? When he has leveled its surface, does he not sow the black cumin and scatter the cumin? Plant the wheat in rows, the barley in the appointed place, and the spelt in its place. Verse 26, for he, God, instructs him, the farmer, in right judgment. His God teaches him. For the black cumin is not threshed with a threshing sledge, nor is a cartwheel rolled over the cumin. But the black cumin is beaten out with a stick and the cumin with a rod. Bread flour must be ground, therefore he does not thresh it forever. Break it with his cartwheel or crush it with his horseman. Verse 29. This also comes from the Lord of hosts, who is wonderful in counsel and excellent in guidance. So what Isaiah the prophet is telling us, he's, he's saying, look at the farmer. And of course, this was written in Bible times. If he was to write it today, he said, look at the software engineer, look at the architect, look at the civil engineer. He said, look at them. That's written in Bible time. So he's talking about farming. So look at the farmer. How does a farmer know what to do? Where to sow the seed? How to sow the seed? How does a farmer know how to process the grain? Different grains are processed differently. How does a farmer know how to do that? Where did he get that understanding from? And twice in this passage, Isaiah is telling us that God instructs him in this whole process. And the point is that God created such a beautiful world and He put you and me in it so that we can discover, we can investigate, we can explore, we can experiment. And He engages with us in this whole process. So God inspires and instructs our involvement with His creation. As we go about discovering, engaging with this creation, God is involved. 
So whether you're looking through a microscope at a little cell and trying to study what's happening, or whether you're looking through a telescope far out into outer space, trying to figure out what's happening in the cosmos or way beyond, whatever you are doing, God is involved in our exploration and our investigation of His creation. He's, he wants us to discover things that He's actually kept there for us. Yes, there are many things that are a mystery. There are many things that we say, there are, that's secret things. Things that are secret. We probably will never understand. And there are many such things. But we also recognize there are things that God has kept for us to discover. Deuteronomy 29, verse 29. The Bible says the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. Of course, he's talking about the scriptures, but I just want to extend the understanding there. There are many things that are, that are a mystery to us, that belong to God, obviously. He's God, He's omniscient, He's all-knowing. And that's what makes God, God. He knows things way beyond uh, us, what we know. But there are also things that God has revealed to us. Revealed to us in His Word, but also revealed to us in creation. It's hidden there. You and I need to go look. Go explore. He's put it there for us. So we can understand. The Bible tells us the invisible attributes of God are clearly seen in His creation. So we need to go look. And every time you look, it's an opportunity for us to see the design, the greatness, the awesomeness of our God. And you and I must be willing to investigate. There's nothing wrong in, in, in conducting investigation, in looking into things, in exploring new ideas, in being innovative, in trying to push the frontiers of science and technology and, and expand knowledge. There's nothing wrong with that. We need to search out matters. Proverbs 25 verse 2 says that it is the glory of God to conceal a matter, but the glory of kings to search out a matter. So God conceals. He conceals not because He wants to keep it away from us. He conceals it because He wants us to search out. Seek, study, investigate. And it's the glory of kings, kings you translate to modern language, leaders, to search things out. So what do leaders do? They're willing to explore the frontiers of knowledge. They're willing to lead the way. They say, let's go explore. And it's people who are able to search a matter out and to explain that matter. Usually they are the ones who have the positions of leadership. So kings or leaders search out a matter or you can put it the other way. Those who do search out a matter, those who do understand and explain, are the ones who will be recognized as leaders. The point A is that you and I must be willing to investigate and explore and not be afraid to research, to seek out knowledge. So, as believers, as Christians, we are not averse to the expansion and the exploration of knowledge and science, technology, and all other fields. We're not averse to that. It's actually a godly thing. Because God wants us to seek matters out. And all of that, we recognize, has been growing exponentially. Especially in the last decade, or the last few decades. Knowledge has exploded. Information has exploded. But we recognize that as one of the key signs of the times. The explosion of knowledge is really a fulfillment of end time Bible prophecy. Almost 500 years before Jesus, the angel Gabriel spoke to a man named Daniel. And said, Daniel, write this down. Daniel 12 verse 4. He said, Daniel... Shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro and knowledge shall increase. So he's saying, 
about the time of the end. Here's what characterizes that end time. Many will run to and fro. There'll be great travel. And we all see that happening. But he also said, knowledge shall increase. And it's a reality. It's happening. Knowledge is exploding. That's one of the signs of the time of the end. And so we are... We recognize that. But with this explosion of knowledge, the church has a responsibility. Because there are so many things that are coming up, so many matters that are coming up before us. Things that are not just new products saying, okay, here's a product that makes life a little easier for you. Or oh, here's a medical intervention that will help solve a problem. But with these products or with these innovations come strong spiritual and ethical questions. So it's not just we're making life convenient for you, making life better for you. There are related issues that the church has to grapple with. Why is this important? Because the Bible tells us in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, the Bible says that the church is the pillar and foundation of truth. The church meaning you and I. We are the pillar and foundation of truth in this world. If the foundations are shaky, the rest of the structure is going to collapse. Family and society is going to collapse. If the pillars are weak, if the pillars are, are uncertain, or if the pillars are absent, you're not going to have anything, any structure in place for life, for society on earth. So the church... When we say church, it means you and I, people. We are the foundation and pillar of truth. So while we explore and we are discovering new things and, and understanding new things, it's also presenting spiritual, moral, ethical questions. And if we are not there to uphold truth, we are failing in our responsibility as the church. And we, in part, would be responsible for the collapse of society. Because we fail to be the foundation and the pillar of truth where God placed us. So that's why we need to understand how to respond, how to uh, how to bring truth and speak truth and uphold truth in these and many other matters. So we're just touching on three or four things today. Artificial intelligence, neural implants, in vitro fertilization and frozen embryos. And we'll just touch on it. But like these, there are numerous other things. We can talk about gene therapy. We can talk about space exploration, life on other planets, looking for other planets that we want to set up life on, all kinds of things, whether it's far outer space or things that we are dealing with. So our goal today is to help us have a framework how to think about these things so that no matter what the issue, you and I can say, look, these are the things that we are going to use to come up with answers. So let's talk about the dilemmas first. And I'm just going to be very brief on this. Much of this would be common knowledge already. So a brief about artificial intelligence. This is nothing new. From the 1950s, people have been working on this. But it's only in recent times, as recent as a few years back, that artificial intelligence matured to a state where it was accessible to people. And these machine learning models and 
were, were, were trained on huge amounts of data and, and, and are now in a place where they could almost have human, human-like responses and human-like interactions with us. And they're just soft, software and hardware, all in the back, just a string of zeros and ones. And now it is so interwoven with the fabric of our daily lives. Whatever you're doing on the phone, the algorithms that are serving you, content that you consume, uh, decisions that you make, whether you ask chat, GPT or Gemini or whoever you like to, or whatever you like to use. All of these things, our life is so uh, intertwined with these applications. Some of us may be using it to write emails to your bosses and generate content for your whatever work you're doing. And it's fine. It just makes life easier and more efficient. Makes us look good. And it's also being used in almost every industry. Bringing benefits, of course. And healthcare, AI is being used to in assist in diagnosis. And pharma is being used to help in drug discovery. So many benefits. But along with this, there are concerns. Job displacements. What about the potential misuse of AI in the creation, the propagation of deep fake images and videos and our governments using it for citizen surveillance everywhere you walk, every move you make? Somebody knows. Or even engaging in warfare using AI to combat. So there are all of these Beneficial uses, but they're also uses that could be harmful, detrimental. And so this brings us to some questions. The first one. At a personal level, are we moving in a direction where at some point we are losing our own cognitive independence? In some cases, we are losing our own soul. And is it possible that in some churches, spiritual formation happens through AI? That you come to church and you don't listen to a real pastor, but you have an AI pastor. It's, good. it's a good message. Really good message. But you don't need a human. It's all delivered to you through AI. It's happening in some churches. So are we just going into that? Where we eventually, where AI shapes our minds, our emotions, our behaviors. It's so much easier to interact with a tool that doesn't shout back at you than to talk to a real person who has the same answer, probably a better answer. But it comes packaged with a lot of emotion. And so, we could potentially distance ourselves from other people and be very comfortable with our AI companion who gives us all the answers. One source for truth. But that's a dangerous progression. Studies show that some people have fallen in love with their therapist. Not a real person. But a bot that they speak to, engage with on their device. They're emotionally engrossed in it. They even go to the extent of doing what the bot tells them to do. The life is now controlled by that therapist or companion they have on their device, engaging on their device. It's, I mean, it's not, this, this is not made up, it's happening. People have already lost their soul. Second question. Are we going to allow AI to take over tasks that are to be performed by humans? And to what extent? Can doctors, counselors, therapists, and even pastors and preachers be replaced? Third question. Who's going to be in charge? In the, in the Genesis Commission, in the Garden of Eden, when God placed Adam and Eve, He spoke to them and He said, Be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth, subdue and have dominion. So man or people were so, supposed to have dominion. 
But are we going to create machines to whom we hand over this commission? Several AI leaders have already issued a call to pause further development out of a concern that we might develop non-human minds that might eventually outnumber, outsmart, and make us obsolete and replace us, and we risk the loss of our own civilization. They've expressed their concern. Governments are trying to determine how to control the potential misuse of AI by bad actors. And EU, the European Union, is, is a leader in policy decision-making in, in many, many aspects. And in 2021, they, they tabled the AI Act, which recently passed in March 2024, one of the leading thoughts on policy-making on how to some way regulate, control, direct AI applications. And so they have identified three risk categories, and whatever application you build is going to fall into one of these three risk categories. And other countries are following. So there are all these questions, a spiritual question. Are we doing the right thing or are we giving up our commission from God? Other ethical questions. Talk briefly about neural implants. So these are just tiny devices that are placed in our brain or on our brain. And they can interact with through the electrical activity with our brain, to the neurons. And these neural implants, unlike other implants, we have been doing medical implants for a long time. But the neural implants are different because they can transmit signals out of your brain and to your brain. So these neural implants now become a brain-machine interface. Machines can transmit signals to your brain and, your, and yet that can also transmit signals from your brain. Now, there are medical advantages or uses for these. Example, to improve functions of those who have lost functions due to injuries, diseases, even blindness. Uh, controlling a prosthetic limb or uh, uh, helping people with Parkinson's disease through these brain implants. Managing epilepsy, even depression. So there are these beneficial uses of these neural implants, but... What's out on the horizon is we could actually boost memory, focus. All of us need that, I think. But. And also, we could possibly have brain-to-brain -brain communication by thought. So I don't have to stand up here and exert so much energy. I can sit at home and think, and you can hear my sermon. Just joking. You're not going to do that. <laughs> but we can actually have brain-to-brain -brain communication. Or brain-to-machine. So you can think and tell things to do. Or machines or instruments to do things. Some of us love that. Get my coffee. <laughs> Make my breakfast. Iron my clothes. <laughs> So it all seems so wonderful. But then, here are the spiritual and ethical dilemmas. First one, are we giving up control of our minds to machines? But machines know your thoughts because they're translating those signals to your actual thoughts. They read your mind, literally. And they can control your thoughts, your memories, even your actions. So are we giving up control? Second question. This so-called medical intervention, and we have, we've had numerous of them which are beneficial to us, but this one, is it a violation of God's design? Or is it within the sphere of human intervention when compared to other forms of medical implants that we already have. Because this is very different. So are we violating God's design with this? 
And then other social concerns would be when this does become available, goes through all the FDA approvals and so on and becomes available and accessible, available to people, will it be at a cost that will be accessible to everyone? Or is it only going to be some people with a lot of money who have access to this and therefore then become superior human beings? What's going to happen? We have to wait and see. A third area that we want to just mention quickly, a brief about in vitro fertilization and frozen embryos. So IVF is a medical procedure where eggs are extracted from the ovaries and they combine with the sperm in a lab, resulting in fertilization in embryos. And that embryo or embryos are then implanted back into the uterus for pregnancy. So on the one hand, it's beneficial to help couples who are, another, or not, or are otherwise unable to have children. It's a beneficial thing to them that this medical intervention or a medical procedure can help them have children. So it's a beneficial side to it. But then what happens usually in IVF is a large number of embryos are often created. And what happens to these embryos? Sometimes these embryos are frozen for future use. And we have the option of freezing them for years through cryopreservation. And there are people who have been born out of frozen embryos after decades. So can you imagine you're a human being and you realize, man, I was frozen for 30 years. But these are re realities. They're called snowflake babies. Sometimes these embryos are donated to other couples who want to have them. Sometimes they're donated to science for research. And sadly, in many places, these extra embryos are just discarded as medical waste. But keep in mind, every embryo is a real person. Of course, we have the alternative of single embryo transfer where intentionally you make sure that you have only one embryo, that's one, one fertilization that takes place for a single embryo which is then impl implanted into the uterus. So doctors can fertilize one embryo at a time. But here's the reality. While we are thinking about this, in the United States alone, there are over 1.5 million frozen embryos. And you go across different country by country, there are hundreds of thousands of frozen embryos. And we ask the question, are these frozen embryos the new orphans? Because they're real people. So, the spiritual and ethical dilemmas we face here. Should we allow this to continue indefinitely? There is good. A couple can have a child or children as they desire. But here's what's happening in that whole procedure. Should we allow this to continue? Second question. As happens always, and there are one or more embryos, it's a human person deciding, well, I'm going to pick this one and put it back in the uterus. And the others, you know, I'm going to freeze or like we talked about the other procedures, disposal procedures. So is a human playing God deciding who is going to live on the earth and who is not? Are we playing God doing this? A third question 
We recognize that there is the single embryo transfer procedure. But is it contrary to the design of God? Or is this within the sphere of human, human permissible human intervention? That's a spiritual question. Doing this, is it okay before God or is it not okay? And then there are the legal issues which governments are trying to formulate some sort of legal policies which is to recognize the personhood and the right to life of the embryo. The embryo is a person. We call it fetal personhood. So what laws do you pass to protect that person? Big questions. So these are just representative of the cultural issues, the things that are going on in our world because of the advancements of science and technology that you and I have to respond to. How do we respond to it? So first thing that I just want to bring our attention to is to differentiate between wisdom from God and earthly wisdom. James chapter 3 Verses 13 to 18, James tells us, and he draws this contrast, so look at it carefully. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, demonic. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. For the wisdom that is from above is first pure, it's peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, and without partiality and without hypocrisy. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. So you can study this passage, but I'm trying to just help us contrast Wisdom from God and earthly wisdom. Characteristics of wisdom from God. There is good conduct. There is meekness. It's pure. It's peaceable. It's gentle. It's willing to yield. It's full of mercy. Characteristics of earthly wisdom. It's, of course, earthly. It's sensual, gratifying the senses. Demonic. There is bitter jealousy. There is self-seeking. So as we look at the applications of science and technology and these learnings that we're getting to, we're going to ask these questions. In applying this knowledge, is there envy? Is there selfish ambition? Somebody wants to get rich at the expense of ethical, moral, legal issues or the life of another person? And what are the outcomes? You contrast again, if you look at this passage very carefully. The outcome of wisdom from God, it results in good fruit, benefit, good things come out of it. It's without partiality, that means it's fair to everybody. It's without hypocrisy, meaning it's genuine, it's authentic. There is the fruit of righteousness and there is peace that comes out of it. That's the fruit of godly wisdom. On the other hand, the outcome of earthly wisdom is there is confusion in every evil thing. Confusion. People don't know what's right and wrong. People don't know what's good and bad. And every evil thing, the outcome of earthly wisdom. Are you all with me? You're going to sleep? No, still there? Okay. So, our goal must be to use the wisdom and knowledge aligned to divine wisdom. So you got wisdom, you got knowledge, you've you know, come up with some idea, great. But use it in a way that's aligned to divine wisdom. It's got to have these characteristics and it's got to produce this kind of fruit. Now, 
Just pointing out some of the other negatives of earthly wisdom. Earthly wisdom displaces God from our lives. Paul wrote in Romans 1, 22 to 23, said, Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into something else. They thought they were wise. And what do they do? They got, got, got rid of God and they put something else in its place. That's what earthly wisdom does. It displaces God from our lives. Earthly wisdom will not enable us to encounter God. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 20, 21, he said, Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God. The world through its own wisdom will never encounter God. So we are trapped in just earthly wisdom. And that becomes our motivator. We're not going to encounter God. Even though we're actually exploring God's creation. And thirdly, we must walk humbly before God and take no pride in earthly wisdom. 1 Corinthians 3, 18 to 20, Paul writes, he says, Lord, let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you seems to be wise in this age, that means you think you've got wisdom in this age, let him become a fool that he may be wise. In other words, don't depend on your, wisdom, your own earthly wisdom. Become a fool. Let it go so that you can be wise with the real wisdom from God. He says in verse 19, for the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. Earthly wisdom, God looks at it as foolishness. So recognize that we desperately need to operate out of divine wisdom as characterized in James 3 and not be trapped with just earthly wisdom. So, let me share with you a simple framework for decision making. So as you and I face these kinds of matters, how do we make the decisions? How do we say it's okay, it's not okay? This would be acceptable to God. This is not acceptable to God. How do we? Three simple things. One, is it for good? We saw one of the characteristics of godly wisdom is it bears the fruit. It bears good fruit. It's peaceable. It brings mercy. It brings the fruits of righteousness. It means it's blessing people. So that's the first thing. Is it doing good? There's nothing wrong in using advancements in technology and science in ways that are benevolent, that are edifying and blessing to people. Is it solving problems, making you more productive, making you more efficient in your work, or helping address a disease or uh, address a physical problem? Is that a good thing? Yeah, okay. It's doing good to people. Is God desiring to heal somebody? Of course. Is God desiring to restore somebody's, uh, some, somebody from their injury? Of course. Is God desiring to, for couples to have children? Of course. It's good. The second thing we must recognize, and especially in, in many of these areas that are still in their exploratory stage, where a lot of work is going on, we haven't arrived, this, we haven't reached the full stop yet. Which means tomorrow there could be some new things that come up which challenge us with new questions. So that second thing is we must be willing to ask questions. We must be willing to discuss these things. And not preemptively come to a conclusion before new information. Because some of the conclusions we arrive at before having further information could be wrong. So be open. To discussion. We won't have immediate answers, but as we continue to engage and discuss, we must seek ways to do things that are honorable and in line with godly wisdom. New information, okay. The same plumb line applies. I will operate by godly wisdom. New discoveries, okay. I will apply godly wisdom. So you're open to questions, open to new information. And thirdly, 
we must place boundaries and safeguards on the use of technology and science. Worship team, please come. We must place boundaries and safeguards on how we are using these so that we stay aligned to God's original design and intent. Stay aligned to that. This is what my heavenly father designed and this is his intent. I'm going to stay aligned to it. We must uphold truth that all human life from conception on is God-given, must be treated with absolute dignity. People must be treated fairly with equity. So we establish boundaries. So in your own personal life, as you come face to face with these or maybe some other kinds of matters, think about these three things. Is it doing good? Is it helping people? Second, I'm ready to discuss. I'm ready to, ready to think through. But godly wisdom is my plumb line. Godly wisdom. That's my plumb line. I'm open to discussion. You've got new information. I'm open to it. But godly wisdom. Third, I'm going to where I say? have boundaries. I'm going to have boundaries. I'm going to put safeguards so that I don't violate God's design and God's intent. Either in my life or in somebody else's life. What is God's design? What is God's intent? I'll stay aligned to that. It's never to destroy another life. So when you think about in vitro fertilization, on the one hand, yes, you're doing good to a couple. But do it in such a way that you don't have to destroy another life. So there's a boundary there. There's a guidance there. And the use of all the other technologies. Yeah, you can help people. But is it God's will for somebody to lose, give up control of their mind to another machine or to another person? Never. God respects human will. We see that throughout the Bible. So we must also be respectful of the other person. Their free choice, their free will. We can't make them robots. We can't dictate their choices. There's a safeguard. There's a boundary we place. Remember that you are the pillar and foundation of truth where God has placed you. The church, meaning you. In whatever place in life, there will come a time that you have to speak. You have to say something. And you are the church. What you say is going to become the foundation and pillar of truth at least to one other person at least to one other person some of you are in places where what you say will affect the foundation and the pillars tens of lives hundreds of lives maybe thousands of lives God has placed you there to be the foundation and pillar of truth so what you say matters so remember this there is godly wisdom divine wisdom and God is counting on you to bring that wisdom into all these diverse spheres around us each one is placed in a certain sphere and God's counting on you to be the bearer of truth the standard bearer of truth right where he's placed you and would to God that we will be able to raise up young men and women who will be in those places where they can bring godly wisdom when policies are made when those guidance is given at the highest levels 
Would to God that there is somebody like a Daniel who can speak the wisdom of God and say, this is the plumb line by which we must formulate our policy. That way, nations can be saved. And populations can be preserved. Because you and I are called to be salt and light. Amen. Let's rise to our feet, please. We are grateful to God for all the wisdom He's given, the understanding He's given, the capacity He's given to us as people. But we must not fail to recognize that all that we have has limits. It has limits. We are finite. And God is infinite. God is all powerful. He is all knowing. And He is present here. So at this time, we're going to sing, we're going to declare that God is the one who's a miracle working God. He's a supernatural God. That means where our natural abilities come to an end, there is more. God is the one who takes over. He's a miracle working God because when our best efforts come to an end, there is God who can do things that we can't do. Thank God for what He's given us, but everything we have has a limit. But there is God, who is a miracle-working God, who has no limits, who can work in your life and mine, who can work miracles in your life and mine. He can heal our bodies, our minds. He can work in our life situations. He can turn things around. He's still the miracle-working God. He's still the miracle-working God. He hasn't changed. The God of the Bible is still the God of today. So as we take these next few moments, would you look to this awesome God? Acknowledge that all our best, the best that we have has its limits and invite Him to work miracles in your life. Whatever your need is, whatever the situation where you, got, you want God Almighty to intervene, call upon His name and ask Him in the name of His Son Jesus to intervene. He's more than able to do it.
Father, we just bow before you this morning. Father, we are grateful for all the knowledge, for all that you blessed us with, things we can enjoy. We thank you, God. But Father, we know that the best we have has its limits. There's only so much. And we stand before you as people who need your touch, who need you, who need your work in our lives. Only you can save. Only you can heal. Only you can deliver. And God, we invite you by the power of your Holy Spirit, Father, even in this place, for people who need your touch, that by your Spirit you'll touch, heal, deliver, make whole, release pain, release anxieties, release fears, that people might be free, God this place in the mighty name of Jesus. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, they come against every tormenting, oppressive spirit of fear and anxiety and depression that's troubling minds. Your foul, evil spirits, I command you to leave in the name of Jesus. I command people to be completely free their minds take authority of every spirit of infirmity every spirit of sickness and disease and Satan you are crushed you are defeated and so in the mighty name of Jesus I command spirit of sickness and disease to leave let healing come Freedom from pain, from arthritic conditions, from disorders in their body that are they've been there for years. Every spirit causing those disorders, I command you to leave in the name of Jesus. Chronic illnesses be healed in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we invite your intervention in life situations. We ask God that you who part of the Red Sea, that you will open up doors for people. Even those who stand before a closed door right now, in the name of Jesus, let them see that door swing wide open for them. Because you are the God. When you open a door, no man can shut it. The people who stand before a mountain that seems insurmountable, a mountain of debt, a mountain of legal issues, cases, a mountain of accusations. In the name of the Lord Jesus, I command that mountain to move. God, you make a straight path for them because you can. And you will. That they will see the sovereign hand of God move that mountain out of their way. And they'll be able to move forward in their life. Into the destiny that you have for them. Into the plan that you have for them. So Father, thank you for doing this. I speak your peace, God, in homes and families that are disturbed and troubled. Let the peace of God come in. Let the shalom of God prevail in those homes, in those families, in those relationships. Let me thank you, Father. Thank you. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, our Heavenly Father, and the sweet fellowship of His Holy Spirit be with each of us 
always. In Jesus' name. Everyone said, Amen, Amen, Amen. Thank you for listening. We trust this message was a blessing to you. For more free resources, including sermons, sermon notes and books, please visit apcwo.org. For information on APC Bible College in Bangalore, visit apcbiblecollege.org. Do remember to download the All People's Church Bangalore app from the Apple or Google Play Store.